Hello, and welcome to File Catalyst January webinar. This month, we'll be talking about how fi accelerated file transfers and how File Catalyst can help with live sports production. My name is John Tkachevsky. I'm the president and co-founder of Unlimitex Software, the makers of File Catalyst products. I have with me this month Christian Charette, Director of Software, our Director of Software Development. Christian has been involved very closely with the development of the features for live broadcasters within the File Catalyst product line. And please check out our blogs. Both Christian and I uh, write frequently on our blog about feature, about usually about file transfer, but sometimes we always talk about software development or any other networking uh, news. So yeah, check out our blog. There's always a lot of good articles there. So uh, today we're going to be talking about, first of all, we're going to give you a quick introduction about accelerated file transfers and why File Catalyst uh, is, you know, faster than uh, or better than uh, traditional methods. We're going to be talking about the challenges that live broadcasters, or it's not really just sports, but it could be any live event production has. Uh, but uh, mostly, uh, we've built these features mostly around the sports, uh, sports venues. So we'll talk about the challenges, and then we'll provide you some solutions that we've built into File Catalyst uh, to help you with these problems within uh, within uh, with these problems with live sports production and uh, File Catalyst. And finally, of course, we'll show you a demo of how things look, so you have just an idea at least about the, how the software looks and behaves and what, what to expect. So uh, what we do is we concentrate on large file transfer. And what's large files? Well, that's big data. That's uh, big files, uh, usually, you know, anywhere from, you know, few gigs up to, you know, terabytes. Uh, in most sports production events, where we look at files at about 100 gigs, 10 to 100 gigs, that would be usually uh, the norm in the live sports events we've seen. Um, uh, what we do is that we can transfer these files into anywhere in the world between two points, and where the transfer is always going to be as quick as possible. That means we're going to be immune to any network impairments, such as latency and packet loss. Uh, we, what we've done, we've built our own UDP-based file transfer protocol, and the reason why it shows UDP is that UDP uh, you, doesn't waste any time communicating between the two points. The data is sent, and it goes as fast as possible. So let's first talk a little bit about TCP. Well, TCP has been around for a really long time. Without TCP, you would not have internet today. Almost everything you're doing on the internet today uses TCP. Uh, things, protocols like brow web browsing, HTTP, sending out emails, FTP, SFTP, uh, Samba or Windows file sharing. That's all uses TCP as the underlying uh, uh, tra data transfer. Uh, TCP is reliable. Uh, it works well, but as soon as you start introducing latency or packet loss or any kind of network impairments, TCP starts slowing slowing down a lot. So what we've built, we've built a protocol based on UDP, which, you know, is much more leaner and faster. And then we've added the reliability and the congestion control into our application. So you think of it as the reliability and congestion control now being handled by the application layer, which is File Catalyst. Uh, like this, we don't sacrifice any of the advantages UDP gives us, and we also provide the reliability. So if there's a you know, a packet gets dropped while we're transferring files, we, we, we retransmit that data and we can handle it. Same thing with congestion control. We will not, uh, UDP is known for going super fast and being very aggressive and crashing routers. Uh, we don't do that because we actually have congestion control built in. So we can detect uh, the maximum capacity of a link. Uh, so, so we always, you know, stay within the parameters of the connection. So, you know, your buffers don't overflow and your, your routers don't crash. So the important part is that when we when you re, when you transfer files with File Catalyst is that if a connection drops for any reason, we will automatically reconnect and resume transfers from that point where 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 files stopped last time. So we don't have to start from the beginning. And we also do this in a very smart way that we actually when we resume the transfer, we'll verify what has arrived 
and what has been sent, do a delta on the two, uh, sorry, not a delta, but we'll do a MD5 checksum, and then we'll resume. So it's not a blind resume like you would see with FTP uh, or SFTP. We actually we will do an MD5 checksum, making sure that both parts are identical before we resume. So this guarantees that your data always arrives intact. So here's some uh, speed gains that you would normally see with file catalyst. Uh, here's in the transfer scenario from New York to LA. This is within uh, continental US. Network is really good within network uh, within continental US. So a 10 gig file over a 100 megabit line with uh, round trip time or latency of 50 milliseconds with FTP takes about two and a half hours. With file catalyst it takes 14 minutes. So that's a gain of uh, roughly 10, uh, 10 times. Um, now let's take this example to LA to London. Now we're going, you know, we have to go across continental US and then we have to go under, uh, over the ocean. So now the distance has grown. Uh, same 10 gig file with RTT now of 250 milliseconds because now we're going further. This is how long it takes uh, on the internet to move one packet of data from LA to London. Uh, now FTP will take 12 hours and 15 minutes while file catalyst continues going on 14 minutes. So this is a 53 times uh, improvement. Now of course if we have no latency, so let's say we're transferring files from one computer to the next and computers are next to each other and our RTT is zero, then you know uh, FTP would probably be also around 14 minutes just as file catalyst. So for local can, local transfers, you know, the improvement is not as much, but as soon as you start going over overseas or uh, over uh, wider wider geographical locations, then the improvement becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, which is perfect for live sports production because events are usually all around the world. And for example, this year we have Olympics in Sochi in Russia, we have World Cup in Brazil, and we have actually I think the next Olympics are also in, in Brazil. So Brazil is very lucky this year. So you can't always move your studio and your staff. Uh, you can't always build a new uh, production studio and your staff in, on, in all those events. It, it becomes expensive and transferring these files into your central studio where you can actually work on the files with, uh, with, with all your equipment available to you it was much more uh, it's much less expensive and much easier to do uh, so sending you know just one server with some storage is a lot easier than moving the entire editing suite um, so uh, another thing that live sports production usually handles is that you have files that are very big um, We've seen files anywhere from 10 to 100 gigs uh, with live sports. Uh, of course, we can handle files bigger than that, uh, depending on what your workflow is uh, or your file workflow is. Uh, so we can handle files, you know, up to up to several terabytes as well. And another thing we've noticed is that MXF files, which is a very common file production for for sports production, is very uh, changes a lot from venue to venue, from uh, event to event. And we'll be talking in a minute about what we've seen with these MXF files. But what we've tried to do is build a solution that is not specific to a specific encoding in within the MXF files. We rather looked at the behavior of the MXF file on a disk and how it was behaving. And we tried to move the MXF, we, we move the MXF file from the disk to, to, to another disk instead of looking what's inside. So our, uh, our solution is very agnostic to, uh, to different type of, uh, and coding types you might have it within an MXF file. Uh, another another problem with uh, sporting events, especially the larger ones, is that you're going to have many camera feeds. So this will create many MXF files that you need to move almost in real time back to the studio. Um, what we do with over here is that we you can create one one single task within File Canvas Hot Folder, and that task will pick up any new feeds should they arrive on the storage. So uh, you don't have to create many, many tasks for every single feed you want to do. You create one task and the task will pick up any new content that needs to be moved to the studio. This, cre th this sim greatly simplifies your, your, um, your, uh, management, key, your management of these, of these uh, file transfers because you don't have to create all these tasks individually, but we'll just rather use one task and everything gets created. We'll show this in the demo in a, in, 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 in a minute, in a few minutes to, to see, to, to, to illustrate how this works. And finally, another challenge is that the MXF, uh, the, the files for live sports events usually grow. 
Uh, so as the feed comes in, the, this creates a growing files on your storage, and now you want to move that file. And growing files for live sports events are also not the same. One grow file is different than another grow file because uh, uh, dependingly on the format and the encoding, things will look different. So this is where where we, what we what we looked at is we looked at the MXF as a container. And we wanted to really look at the behavior of the MXF of the grow file on the disk uh, rather than, you know, what's the encoding inside or the metadata. So what we've noticed is that, you know, in most cases, uh, the growing, the file will grow in, grow in the tail. So that means as more data is, arrives from the camera, it gets appended to the MXF file and the MXF file automatically grows. It's a, it's a very simple chase the tail type of uh, type of uh, scenario that exists but we've also seen grow uh, growing MXF files where it's more like a container so imagine uh, you have a preset size of the file of the MXF file and th that file is then filled almost like a water pitcher uh, with with content and then there's the question of the headers um, sometimes the headers will get updated every time something gets added to the file and that will modify your headers. And your headers could be, you know, right in the beginning, but they could be also within the essence as well. You could have, uh, you could have my headers changing. So not necessarily headers mean right in the beginning. It could be all over the place. And another one is that as the file is completely written to the disk, then the headers are finally rewritten as the file is finalized. So we've seen both workflows. Uh, on the with with, with 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 our system. So once again, the file changes in different places at different times. So we've built a lot of we've built tools in File Catalyst to handle these different uh, use cases for growing files. And this is where I'm going to introduce uh, Christian is going to go in detail how we've built uh, File Catalyst features around these different growing file problems. And also how we handle, you know, the other other aspects of MOOC concurrency. So uh, here is Christian. Uh, please give us the rest of information. Thank you. Make some minor modifications, add some features once again to make sure we can handle all sorts of conditions. So one of the things that we've done uh, is uh, when we were approached by multiple uh, vendors or multiple clients, uh, they asked us, "Listen." We've got a lot of files we're going to be generating, for example, uh, sporting events like the Olympics. Um, I need to make sure that you guys can handle multiple growth files and you keep tailing them, right? Um, so the first thing is uh, if, you, if you have a, a file which is growing, so you keep appending data at the back, we've got a feature called progressive. And so what we do is every single time we encounter a file, We'll take it, we'll follow it, making sure that data, um, making sure that we transfer the whole file when we first saw it. And then at the very end of the transfer, what we're going to do is we're going to check, has the file grown? If so, then we relaunch another transfer and keep appending to it. Essentially, we resume the transfer, and we keep doing this all the way up until um, the file is completely transferred or growth has stopped. So that's, that's one of the first features uh, that File Catalyst offers, um, where, once again, we can follow growth files. Uh, the second one is because there's multiple growth files, one of the features we've introduced recently uh, is to have multi-client transfers. And so what this is, is uh, we'll scan a directory. If you've got multiple files in there, you can specify how many clients, how many, in this case, how many growth files or how many connections you would like to uh, establish. And then what we'll do is we'll actually go in, the clients will look at each of the files and start following them if necessary. So you can have three, four, five growth files and then still have resources to pick up additional static uh, content uh, in your directory. And so what we can do is we can really handle, and this goes up to 100 clients. Um, and so what happens is we're able to manage a lot of different feeds coming in, take them, send them across the wire, um, regardless of latency. And it works relatively well, very easy to manage, because it's just one task in the hot folder that can be launched in order to manage them all. Let um, me just, before uh, we move on to the next slide, I just wanted to say, if you have any questions during this webinar, please fill out the, uh, there's a question pane, question box that you should see within the web, uh, go to webinar window, and just uh, enter your questions there. We'll handle them at the end of the presentation. Thank you. The, um, 
Another issue that we encountered is while uh, a lot of these systems are generating these high resolution files, what they also do is they generate a low resolution proxy file. Um, this way what happens is that the camera is doing the filming um, on the remote location. Uh, they have a smaller video they can send back to headquarters. Um, the editing, uh, the, the, the off-site um, editing studio can have a look at it and decide, yep, we need certain clips. Um, so these proxy files are growing at a much, much slower rate than the throughput they actually have on site, uh, for example, in, in the Olympic Games coming up. Um, so what we've had to do is uh, the software, as it was done a couple of years ago, would check the file, send all the data, but because it was sending the data so fast and the growth of that proxy file was relatively slow, um, it, it would look to the software like it was static, data wasn't going in, so immediately, boom, it would fire off saying, yep, file is done, move on to the next file, and, and the proxy file, no, 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 it's, it's still growing. So what we've done is inside the software, we've enabled so that for dynamic files, what we can do is we can add a pause. So after you've transferred the file over, I want you to pause for a certain amount of time and then check to see if the file has grown. And this gives you a lot of flexibility, and it allows to make sure that if the file is really still growing, um, there's a very easy mechanism you can put into place and then we can we can make sure we wait a certain amount of time and for slow growth file this works exceedingly well um, where's the mouse click Aha. but we've also encountered some uh, very strange behavior I guess from a file transferring perspective which you normally expect for a growth file is uh, data gets put in and much like a log file you expect the data only to be put in at the end um, and uh, media files, uh, large systems uh, that take it, compress the data, and then dump it into uh, storage ready for transfer. Um, what we've realized very quickly with uh, some of our customers is that they were doing some strange things. One of them is, once again, after the entire file has been transferred, so we could be tailing the file now, and then at the very, very end, ah, we need to go back to the header and we need to change a couple of bytes. And from a file transferring perspective, that really like for, for regular, if, if you use, you know, FileZilla, you use another standard uh, file transfer solution, uh, what happens is because if you're tailing the file, you've already transferred that first, you know, megabyte, gigabyte of the file. So the headers have already been across. So if, if all of a sudden you go back and you change the headers, uh, the, the transferring software kind of has no idea. And so it's, it's, it's waiting there and saying, well, listen, the two files don't match, even though I've transferred every single byte. Um, so what we've done is we, we've put multiple solutions in place, depending on what, what your needs are. Uh, each has their pros and their cons in order for you to, to adapt to that kind of a scenario and handle it very eloquently. Um, the first one is, or is uh, what we call, um, it, it's essentially we, we wait till the file is essentially stop growing in order to transfer it. And so what happens is, uh, when the files get received onto the remote SAM, um, what happens is they'll start writing the file, you start adding gig, 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 all the way until, I don't know, it reaches, let's say, 100 gigabytes in size. And then you go back and you look at the header. And normally there's a known time. It'll take Within a minute, the header will be changed, normally with uh, basic statistics like metadata information, like the file, of uh, the size of the file, et cetera. Um, so if on the transfer you specify, listen, I, I want you to hold off, do not transfer a file, up until it is at least one minute old. Okay, what this allows you to do is it allows the, the entire file to be written out to disk safely. Then the headers get written, and then 60 later, boom, I kick off a transfer. So it means, of course, that when the actual file is written, we're not tailing it. But what it means is, from a networking perspective, we only send the file once, and we'll wait essentially until the job is done to transfer it out. So from a network utilization perspective, it's very efficient. Um, the second... Actually, another, another uh, aspect of this is when large files are getting copied to a network drive from another system. So let's say the, cop the network copy will be pretty fast because it will be local, but still these files are so big that it could take, you know, five, six minutes. So we don't want to start transferring these files as Windows is copying the file. We want to wait until the operating system finishes the copy before we start our tasks in the hot folder. Yeah. Um, the other thing that we can do is what we, what we can do is as you start adding to the file, we launch a transfer with tail the file. So as you're adding the file to disk, we're already starting to transfer it out. At the very, very end of the transfer, if you go back and you change some data, whether it's a header or halfway through the file, what we do is 
uh, we can specify that we're going to wait, as, once again, a specified amount of time. It could be five seconds. It could be 60 seconds. And then we relaunch a transfer, but we relaunch it using deltas. Now, delta is kind of an R-sync scenario. Um, and, and what this means is we look um, using a series of rolling checksums. So it's a lot of, you know, people have gotten their PhDs trying to figure out how to do this stuff. Um, what we do is we look at the, the binary of the files um, on both sides, and we actually check what has changed in the file. From, from a binary. So it doesn't matter if, once again, they, they modified a couple of bytes in the header or halfway through the file. Um, when we start transferring with the deltas, you have some calculations done on both sides, and then we can transfer exactly what has changed. And so in the case of, for example, a couple of bytes being sent um, in the header, once the file is transferred, we'll relaunch the deltas. Once the computations are done, we'll see, ah, a couple of bytes need to be sent fire those off on the network. It's a little bit more uh, computational, so there's a little bit more I.O., obviously, because you have to rescan both sides of the file after the transfer is already done. There's also, because it's it, a lot of checksums are done, um, it's, it's a little bit intensive computationally. But from the networking side, very little resources is, uh, is spent, and um, only the data that needs to be sent across is actually sent. So it's a very elegant solution, and it also makes sure that the data is there as fast as possible. Okay. So, and this is, uh, this is our upcoming hot folder 3.3.1. Uh, and from what you see over here is exactly what we've described. Uh, these are dynamic files, uh, settings, uh, features that you can enable. And you can actually decide, once again, what the rules are, what, how you would like the software to behave um, when it encounters uh, files which seems to be growing and changing. So they're very, very easy to use, and, uh, and this is what will be used uh, in the coming weeks. So, so here's uh, just to uh, uh, re recap what, uh, what what, how an accelerated file transfer or how File Catalyst can help with uh, live sports events. First of all, you've got very large files that you need to send over very, very wide geographical distances. Uh, this is where the accelerated file transfer part is helping. Uh, we've built the special rules to handle growth files for MXF, so we can accept almost any kind of a behavior from the MXF file, and we'll be able to send it progressively. Uh, we've built extreme concurrency transfer feature. That means uh, if there's more than one grow files or more than one camera feed, we will handle them dynamically that everything arrives automatically so you don't have to create you know 100 tasks for every single for every single feed but rather you can just you know make one task and the task will pick up new feeds and transfer them over the wire and of course you can control which one has priority which one doesn't uh, what as these files are transferring so you know you might not be for example for Sochi you might be more interested in <laughs> hockey than uh, some other events so you might give it more priority and transferring, of course, the dynamic file sets, so growth files, as the files are being created. So these are, these are some of the solutions we have in, within the File Catalyst feature set. So here's, a, Christian, can you go over us? Here's a sample event of a File Catalyst at a live sporting event. Uh, this was actually taken from Sochi. Uh, and uh, Christian, can you just go over quickly the deployment, and then we'll go into the demo? Yeah, so this is a partial kind of a deployment uh, picture we have uh, running um, I guess in, in the coming few weeks we'll have this uh, scenario live. And so what you see here is you have uh, multiple cameras going in, uh, putting data uh, into a local SAN found uh, in Russia. Um, from there, a hot folder picks up the data, uh, checks the data in the transfer cache. So we, we have a feature in the file catalyst called the transfer cache to make sure that the hot folder will only send the file once unless the file is changed. Um, and so once a file is put into the um, the SAN, we'll check, have we already sent the file, is the timestamp changed? If so, yep, we take it, we pop it onto uh, a queue internally within the task, and then from there on in you have your multiple workers picking up the file and transferring it remotely. So in this case here we can get uh, you know, up to 100 feeds uh, that are coming in being created by uh, the broadcasters up in Russia, grab them, and then push them out to Europe or North America in a very timely manner where they can then, you know, be taken, ingested within the, the broadcasting, whether it's uh, to go on their website or to go live uh, on, tel on the television feed. So uh, 
here we're we're going to show you some of the concurrent file transfer features and some progressive features right now. So Christian, uh, please uh, open up the. Uh, I guess it's VNC, right? That's what we're using. Yeah. <laughs> So what I have here is I've got a um, yeah, I'm all right. So I've I've got a hot folder set up. Let me see if I can stretch the window out a little bit. I have a hot folder set up on a on a machine. Um, I'm going to be talking to a server, and I've I've set up the configurations uh, for the server much like we're having from North America to Russia. And so if I go in, for example, over here, let's see if I can. You know, if I ping my remote server, so, uh, um, hold on a second, I've you, lost, you can take the mouse. I've lost focus, there we go, 10.1.1.59, I believe. So I've got about a latency of about 150 milliseconds, which is probably what you get um, between New York and, and Russia at present. I okay. think it's a bit more, but... Let's let's not dwell on details. <laughs> yeah. And so um, what I have here is I have a hot folder, and I'll just kind of walk you through it. This is hot folder uh, version 3.3, which is currently uh, available up on our website. And what I have over here under the transfer, you can see that I've, I've enabled the multi-client, so I'm going to be up to six streams going across. And so what the hot folder is doing constantly is it's scanning every 10 seconds it's scanning the directory. It's scanning the directory, looking for work, looking to see if there's anything uh, to create um, to transfer up. So I have a. What I'll do here is I'll, I'll just create a whole bunch of M MFX files. I have a, a script to kind of do that, and I'll be creating them each at uh, half a gigabit uh, per second. So as soon as I fire this off, I can see over here that my files have arrived and they are growing. And then if I look at the transfer as it comes in, so what happens here is that my hot folder realizes, hey, I've got a whole bunch of files that are growing. I launch them. I start them up. And you can see right now that I've got uh, six gigabytes or so. And so what the file catalyst software is doing, it's checking every, every half second to see if the file has grown. And then it, it transfers as fast as it can. So what I've got here is I've got a two gigabit link between the server and the hot folder, which uh, mimics what a lot of customers have right now, going from Russia out to either Europe or North America. And you can see that I am following the data. Everything is, everything is coming in. The software is constantly checking to see if the file grows and is just tailing it. And can you just show the Linktropy maybe? Linktropy is the emulation software yeah. we're using between the two machines. So you kind of see here the data, the data throughput. So so yeah. you can see here that we're utilizing... Uh, I'm utilizing two gigabits worth of data. It's a nice steady stream. Uh, no problem there. And if you go back to the progress bar, you'll see that the progress bar is always chasing the, the yeah. end, but never quite making it to the end. Yeah. Because the, as the files are growing, the, uh, the progress bar is always chasing the tail. Yeah, <laughs> and it'll grow until about, I think I said it, so it'll grow all the way to about 30 gigs or so. And so uh, the clients are all moving, they're all transferring, and they're all kind of balancing it out between them. And you can see here that these are different MXF files. In our example, we're just using some sports names, but uh, this could be, you know, camera feed one, camera feed two, whatever, whatever you want to call it. And we didn't have to set up a specific task for every feed. Everything got picked up automatically and start getting transferred. And then you can drill down to any of these transfers and, and see what's going on in details. In fact, actually, you get quite a bit of details already here, but uh, yeah. uh, you can see here every every transfer, what what what's happening with it, and uh, you can uh, you can you, you can really really manage your system well between the uh, during the during transfer of uh, of growth files. But what you see here is we're managing the two gigabit link without without too much of a problem, and I think it's just about to wrap up, and that's it. There we go, the files are there, and we're done. And and now everything has been transferred. Yeah, everything's been transferred. Yeah. Great. So, uh, so you, I'm not going to already pitch here, it's just a little slide here what we do, but we do accelerated transfers. 
we specialize a lot within the broadcast uh, space, especially with live sporting events or live events. And uh, we've been around since 2000, the company. File Catalyst as a product has been in existence since 2006. Uh, we have uh, over a thousand customers around the world using our software. Um, some of our upcoming events, uh, we, uh, we do a lot of the media shows, but many other things as well. Uh, we actually have an Ontario Day in LA today. <laughs> Woohoo! Don't miss that. <laughs> Uh, we're going to have a user forum in uh, London, UK on February 24th. It's going to be located at the, uh, I think it's at the McDonald House, the uh, Canadian High Commission. Uh, it's a very nice historical building. Uh, the event is going to be there the day before BVE at Excel in London. And then we're going to also be in Capsat in Dubai on uh, March 11th. And we can't miss the NAB show, so we'll be there as well. And uh, if uh, we're going to be covering in much, much more detail what we've shown you here at our NAB session uh, called Accelerating Olympic Winter Games Footage from Sochi to Russia, Sochi, Russia to Stamford, Connecticut. So that will be also a very, very good session. If you want to get more details, it will be, it will be an, I think it's an hour, long, an hour and a half long session. And we'll be talking in details and we'll actually have real uh, real production data at that point because that's going to be after the Olympics. And don't forget our monthly webinars. We always try to look for topics. If you have a cool topic you would like to hear, please uh, get back in touch with us and we'll uh, most, most likely we'll consider it for the next uh, release. So let's just go, let's see if we have any questions. Um, let me just close this here. And all those questions. Do we have any questions? No questions. We have a satisfied. We have uh, satisfied. So last chance to enter any of your questions. Uh, if you have no questions, you can always get back to us. You know how. Contact us via you know email or phone or uh, meet us at one of the shows, straight shows, or our user forums. So um, this, I think, concludes our... This concludes our uh, webinar for January. Thank you very much, Christian, for being with me this month. It was a lot of fun. And it's always fun to have you in, uh, in the webinars. And uh, see you next month. Thank you.